Hello and welcome to the Running Channel podcast with me, Andy Badley, my incredibly talented co-host, Sarah Hartley, and Rick, who's involved for some reason that no one really understands. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much. It's really lovely to be here. Yeah. What an intro. We are back and we are bringing you the latest running news, a deep dive into a hot topic in the world of running, which this week is everything super shoes related. Plus, we've got your questions to answer too. So much to get through. Let's get into it. So we are back and we've had a very exciting week, haven't we, Andy? We went on holiday. Well, <laughs> you, you, well you, Rick went on holiday. Yeah. You treated our trip to Lanzarote where we were running a training camp and filming multiple videos as a holiday. But other than oh, that, Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was down by the beach every day. Oh, I, so, so was I, actually. Oh. I had uh, <laughs> yeah. Pina Colada at about 11.30. Did you? We then, were doing hill uh, reps at 8am. Uh, were you? 8am, mm. what was I doing? I was recovering from... Uh, a daiquiri, a strawberry daiquiri, quite a lot of those. At 8 a.m.? Or are you recovering from the Reco- night Recovering, recovering, yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah. he's Excellent. just getting going. Yes, yeah. <laughs> exactly. But anyway, Lo- in the, in the lovely world... Lovely week. <laughs> Brilliant. We had rain, but no, it was amazing. We ran our very first training camp out in Lanzarote and it yep. was epic. Met some great people, did some great running, did my highest mileage week in Well, yeah, a long it's important time. for us to say now we are less than two weeks, so significantly less than two weeks until Sarah takes on a soccer marathon. So... I guess an update for everyone, Sarah. How's it going? I'm terrified. <laughs> Do you feel ready? Um, yes. <laughs> Your voice has got very squeaky. So okay. I'm saying, no, you don't feel ready? No, I do feel ready. I feel so ready. Um, but this is every marathon that I've done previously, which makes it sound like I've run loads. I've run two. Yeah. In the last two that I've done, I have either followed a plan or I've kind of had more of an overview of my training for the last couple of weeks. Whereas I'm still working with my coach, Andy, where he either texts me on a Sunday with my whole training for the week or for this week specifically, he's just been texting me kind of day by day. You feel like you're in the middle of like a taper. You're massively easing down now, right? No, <laughs> I ran 16 kilometers yesterday. So I've been expecting every day for him to be like, like I've got a run tomorrow, which is 35 minutes easy. That's what I was expecting for these last two weeks. Like a Hang on, of Sarah. Are you my not tapering? Up. Are you well, not so, tapering? Well, so this is the thing. When you run your first marathon, if you're following a beginner plan, then your tapering period is going to be a, a relatively more like normal. You'll ease your way down. Whereas because I've been training for quite a long time, my build-up's been well over 16 weeks for this. I'm obviously able to take on more mileage. I'm still tapering off, but I think my brain is still in begin a marathon training whereas actually I'm targeting quite an aggressive PB I've built up a lot of mileage Andy clearly has a lot of faith in me not this one my coach I have Andy. I have plenty yeah. of faith in you Andy is an expert as well and, <laughs> and also I've been there too different but because it was very different distances but he always made me do stuff that I I didn't want to do but it, it keeps your body going it's actually quite important you've been training at a relatively high level and so now maintaining that uh, to some extent and not mm. just doing what you want to do, which was nothing at all. But yeah. you've, never, you've never run a marathon though. That's important to point out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Rick. Although you did actually give a very interesting insight when we were at the training camp. You were oh, saying thanks. how, for once, you were saying how when you used to race, you would actually do like, was it two 30 second efforts at race pace before you started going because it did something scientific that, that's right are you glad, glad you're paying attention scientific yeah that, you sound like, <laughs> hey i love to see your uh, text with andy <laughs> yeah. you know. almost the whole have, gist have, of that have you and, and rick been conferring in the running channel technical library section <laughs> it was something to do with <laughs> vo2 kinetics yes that yeah, one VO2. so it's it's more relevant the shorter you Is go that a board just, game <laughs> <laughs> it's more relevant okay be quiet science time <laughs> we we um it's more relevant the shorter distances you go, five or ten k, and for me, fifteen hundred meters. So in the marathon, probably slightly less so, but yeah, I would run my stride, so one hundred meter efforts at a harder effort to get ready to run at race pace. But then there's really good science behind um, what's called VO2 kinetics, which is how fast your body's able to get up to maximum operating capacity in terms of uh, the way your physiology works. And so to do that, the the recommendation from the science was to do two. 30 second efforts for me. So that would have been roughly 200 meters on the track at my, or even faster than my race pace. And you don't want to do it because you feel that's going to make you tired immediately before your race. But you've got a half an hour window where if you do it in that half hour window, then your body is kind of primed and ready to go. So... Yeah. And that's relative to marathon training. I'm not suggesting anyone should do that on marathon day, but it's relative in that you're gearing up towards a huge distance yeah. that you won't have run in training, but the temptation is to go, right, okay, I need to save my legs. I need super, super fresh yeah. legs. But actually, from my experience, I found that 
there is a very good happy medium. And if you're not sure, the Rally Channel has an excellent marathon training plan, which I've tried and tested and it's great. And that has a proper how to taper towards the end of it. And it does make such a big difference when your legs are fresh, but not too fresh. Yeah, you need to, I mean, to summarize, the the idea of the taper is you, you're still doing enough that your body knows it's going to take on a big challenge soon, but not mm. so much that you're too tired. So you're giving yourself a chance to have that final adaptation, the recovery, ready, and then you'll be ready to go on race day. And ultimately, quite exciting. We're going to, in a future episode, so probably two episodes time, we're going to record, your, not me, but you'll be live from Japan immediately or one day post your your marathon. Well, so I think due to the time space. difference, it's going to be pretty immediate, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. So get ready for my blood, what, sweat and tears. What is the time dif- difference? So eight hours ahead? Yeah, behind? I mean, def- definitely, no, definitely ahead, but I don't know what, um, what the thing is. Oh, we should, hours. I, was actually, I was thinking we should start recording about 8 p.m. UK time, actually. Yeah, that sounds reasonable. 4 a.m.? Yeah. Okay. No, Sarah's not keen. So that's Sarah's <laughs> marathon, that's Sarah's but marathon journey, but that wasn't everything that we did at Anlanzarote. No, right? speaking of big challenges, yeah. you had a big week of mileage, didn't you, Andy? I did, did run a lot more than that. He I'd ran four whole kilometres, everyone. Brilliant. Okay, so <laughs> yes, I did. Sarah, look at me. Oh, I'm, I'm complaining. 16 kilometres, 40 kilometres. Oh, yeah, big, big time. But I did run. I did. It's related to the super shoes as well. We were testing for a video. I yeah. sound barely coherent here because I'm still <laughs> tired from this challenge <laughs> set by the running channel team to test four different pairs of super shoes with a one kilometer time trial each day over four days. The slightly embarrassing thing here is that when I was training at my very best, I used to do eight times one kilometer with one minute recovery. And then my session in Lanzarote was four times one kilometer with 24 hours recovery. And the paces weren't and that And you were different. still slower. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was. So, yes, it isn't the most scientific of tests. You no. were getting more tired throughout the week. Yeah. Your warm up was becoming mm. much longer. Yeah, I was having to warm up more and more, more every day. Because each I, time. Yes, there was, there was a lot of swearing. There was a lot of, oh, my goodness, my body does not feel good. But I, I really enjoyed that challenge. When I was running, I hated the longer runs. I, I loved yeah. the, the workouts and really like running right at my red line and, and maybe beyond sometimes. In fact, Sarah was joking because the very first day, the pair of shoes I was testing, my pacing was so bad. Yeah. It was, it was, it was terrible. It was a kilometre, Andy. I mean, come on, I did more running to the cocktail bar in Tenerife. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, what I, was super I, interesting I though that. was watching Andy's pacing because it was it was relatively flat where we were running. Yeah. I was driving a car. Our videographer Tom was sat in the boot of the car filming Andy yeah, out the back tech. of it. <laughs> high tech. Um, and yeah, your pacing was awful on that first one. But <laughs> after four days, you did get the hang of it. I got the hang of it. And also I'd got the hang of the different shoes. And that segues very nicely into the fact like you need to stay tuned to watch the running time video where we put these shoes head to head against the the, the Nike Vaporfly Next Percent 2, the Next Percent 3 actually, we'll come on to that, is, is just about to launch as well. But to try and give a real benchmark as to the way that different shoes feel um, and different super shoes are fit for different people and different purposes. And today's episode, due to popular demand, because you guys all emailed in to podcast at the running channel.com asking for more information about super shoes. And I know that Sarah, you've got a few. Yes. So there were lots of different questions, lots of different topics. But I think let's start off with what is a super shoe? And can anyone wear one? What is a super shoe? What, <laughs> <laughs> what, is, what is a super shoe? Super I, shoe, I feel Andy. like I've been, I must have had the same sort of liquid diet that Rick clearly had every day in Tenerife. <laughs> if I can't get my words out. Um, what is a super shoe? Really concisely, it's the pinnacle of, of racing shoes. So they should be the shoes that you buy or invest in to help you run fast on race day. Um, and super shoes didn't used to be a thing. Racing flats were the thing. But now that's evolved into these super shoes, which is high stack height. So you're a long way off the ground big stack a big wedge of foam midsole which is really bouncy and responsive and in the majority of cases a carbon plate of some shape or design that sits inside that midsole and the combination of the plate and the midsole propel you forward uh giving you massively higher energy return than anything in in kind of running shoe history so lots of people have been asking should i buy a super shoe yeah should i get a super shoe in fact we even had one question in from someone who had been recommended not to get a super shoe because of their 10k time so for people who are thinking about purchasing what is a super shoe going to do for someone who isn't an elite runner so the first thing to think about is it's not it shouldn't be invest if you're only buying one pair of shoes don't buy super shoes so don't do all of your runs in super shoes um, and that's because they don't last that long. They're really expensive um, and they're not particularly supportive. And we would always advocate that you're mixing up your paces in your run. So if you do want to do a longer, slower recovery run, or even a short recovery run, doing those in super shoes is just going to be inefficient biomechanically. Mm. And then to the question of will they make a non-elite runner faster? In most cases, yes, but not always. And not every brand will suit 
everybody the same way. They fit differently. They use different compounds of foam. Some are really bouncy and then therefore feel quite wobbly. Some are really firm and therefore don't feel like you get the same energy return, but they feel much more stable and planted. Um, those are all the things to, to take into consideration. And then some are wider, some are narrower, some are higher stack height, some are higher drop. So they are totally different. So that's what I found out in Lanzarote. Actually, there's a vast difference between four pairs that are, of shoes that are purported to do the same thing, help you run faster on race day. But they visually look really different. They felt so different on my feet. And that's the thing to think about, that different runners have different paces. Like th There's going to be someone running a five-hour marathon and someone running a three-hour marathon. Their cadence, their gait, their foot strike, all of those things are different. So there's no substitute for actually trying them in real life and seeing what they feel like. And if you're worried about the stability and the risk of injury and so on, then then they're probably not the right thing for you because most of the super shoes do feel um, like as you get tired, you're prone to kind of your knee wandering in towards the center line of your body or um, your your ex your pronation becoming excessive or you're sitting down in your hips to, into that kind of tired running position. That is only going to get exaggerated and then super shoes are likely to highlight the point of, of weakness in your mechanics and could lead to an injury. But if you feel quite efficient and quite strong and you've tried them out, then it's pretty likely that they'll they'll give you a performance advantage. You know, if you run a marathon one day without shoes and another day with the shoes, then you'll run faster. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that they do make a huge, huge difference to lots of people and lots of people love running in them no matter what yeah. their pace is. A lot of these shoes compared to your know, kind of normal everyday trainer, even more so are being tailored towards high up athletes who are trying to break records or run really fast times or win races and so it is going to be probably more so than a trainer that you would buy fresh out the box to wear for every single run the super shoes are going to feel massively different because they are built designed engineered to break records to make people go faster in the in the majority of cases yes and we've even had some manufacturers say to us that their specific shoe is is you know or might only help people who are running sub three hours for a marathon for example and if you're a a 410 mar marathoner wanting to break four hours that their shoe's not the one that's going to help you mm. um i don't know whether they'd say that publicly which is why i'm not kind of naming that shoe brand but that's worth bearing in mind what you want to achieve from it and what you want to wear it for so ideally you'll have a couple of pairs of shoes uh, an everyday trainer and then your super shoes racing in them is what you're aiming to do but you need to train in them because they fundamentally change your biomechanics the way your foot strikes the ground the amount of time your foot spends on the ground where your the way you, you carry your your legs from a running economy perspective because of the stiffness at your kind of at your ankle when you're making contact with the ground all of those things change and so if you're not practicing that then you're actually going to be you might not get as much out of the shoes as possible and the foam and, and carbon plate in combination actually help you recover after you've worn them so don't wear them for recovery this is what i was <laughs> yeah definitely don't substitute out a pair of sliders for super <laughs> shoes they are doing nothing for you yeah but this is what i was going to say as well i didn't realize for ages that super shoes aren't just for race day in fact quite a lot of elites will be training in super shoes or even illegal shoes which i think we've mentioned before yeah, which so are, that's over 40 mil stack height yeah They'll be training in them because they're able to recover faster if they wear them for a hard session. They'll actually feel better and then be able to race harder or train harder the next day. Yeah, the shoes are giving you more impact protection and more energy return when you're making contact with the ground. So when I ran, I had maybe 10 mil of protection in my racing flats that I might have worn on the track or the road for my hard workouts. And that my body took a beating from the impact and, and it took me a long time to recover every day. Whereas uh, anecdotally, a lot of my friends who are competing at a really high level still are saying that they can do stuff they never could have done before if they train in the super shoes. So I just have one quick question. Mm -hmm. How pissed off are you that super <laughs> shoes didn't exist when you were competing? Oh. What type of shoes did exist when you were competing? Sandals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just barefoot. It was just actually a bit of grass. Just wrapped yeah, around yeah, like, <laughs> recording timing on a... Timing on a sundial. I was running in a toga. Um, <laughs> <laughs> actually, actually, I was naked. You, the you, old you ancient, went, you ancient went the Olympics. extra level. Just a yeah. leaf. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just, just a fig leaf. <laughs> just a little tiny leaf. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, how annoyed am I? I'm not an annoyed per se. I think I'd have run faster if I had super shoes, mm -hmm. potentially. Um, but, but it's sort of changed my enjoyment of track and field now uh, and the road racing to see how fast people are running. Because I don't really know how much is the person, how much is the shoe. So I'm pretty sure a lot of the runners running now are better athletes than me. So they'd have run faster than me and have beaten me anyway. But I, I kind mm. of don't know exactly how I'd have compared because I didn't have the same shoes. Mm. There was always evolving technology from cinder track to, to then synthetic tracks. And then even when I was running, the tracks got better and faster and gave more energy return. But it is a, 
a seismic shift if you look at the world records being broken and the number of times now in the top 10 top 20 all-time lists that have been set in the last two or three years it's it's a fundamental change and that does annoy me a little bit oh if it's okay he's not bitter no, he's not, not bitter at all you're not oh, saying oh, that through gritted teeth no <laughs> take, take, take a deep breath Andy it's fine talk about yourself in the third person that's not pretentious <laughs> Brilliant. Uh-huh. well hopefully that has answered a lot of questions about super shoes if you do have any more questions then we love talking about shoes so do email them into podcast at the running channel.com and we can do another whole episode we can do more questions coming on later on um next up we have got the news and we've also got your questions coming up too you are listening to the running channel podcast so it's almost time to answer your questions but up first each week me and andy select a new story from the world of running to talk about andy what have you got this week right well i promise i'm not going to do elite pro running stuff every time that's definitely well i'll do my best anyway but i'm a bit of a but geek. this time it's about that yes it is so please right. please bear with me because i still think it's exciting i promise so people <laughs> are breaking world records because they're wearing super shoes <laughs> <laughs> people, are, people, are, people are breaking world records so it's incredible because this is a really long-standing world record the 3000 meter world record indoors we've been held by daniel Komen for 25 years so since uh, 1998 that's since i've been born oh <sighs> We don't want to talk about that, Sarah. Let's just, it's not all about you. Okay. Anyway, yeah. So yeah. in... Uh, when are you off to a soccer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, bring on that marathon. <laughs> so yeah, the 3,000 meter world record was broken in Lievin in France um, uh, last night at the time of recording by Ethiopian Lemetcha Gurma. Seven minutes, 23. So I pre- There's 3,000 meters? Yeah, so that's... You've been to the track. What did you run when you ran one lap of the track to try and run, run at world record pace? 120 120 so 80 seconds one minute 20 for one lap all out of the track yeah so these, these I can't guys do the math. these guys are running 59 seconds per 400 meters for seven and a half laps it's 15 laps because it's indoors oh, they're so they're only 20 seconds laps. faster than me but they that, did do it quite a lot a lot, a lot yeah <laughs> that's that's well over 100 meters faster per lap <laughs> So, and they're nah, running 200 meter laps. Them. So actually they're, they're, they're <laughs> yeah, quite a long way ahead. It's my, I, I did run the 3000 meters a lot. This is one of my PBs that I was the most proud of. I ran 739 and was super pumped about that. This, this is 15, 16, seconds, hundred meters faster. Um, mm. and yeah, it's just blown my mind. Actually, both of the first two guys, um, so Germa and then Mohamed Katir from Spain, both broke the old world, the old world record. So, um, yeah. that, that, that I, I, I get excited by this, that there is a, I think it's related to the super shoes conversation. The spikes are kind of slightly less impactful because they, they're limited in how high they can be. Mm. But the new foam and, and plates and the spikes, plus indoor surfaces, which actually have a little bit of flex in them as well, whereas opposed to outdoor, the tracks are like on concrete. Um, so there's, there's more bounce. So it's like a perfect storm of energy return in some indoor mm. tracks and some spikes where these people are just running phenomenal, crazy, unheard of, fastest in history times. I have a question about indoor running. Yeah. Is the temperature always the same? No. Uh, and, and different tracks can be, it actually ends up being really dry indoors. Often there might be some air conditioning and things like that. So right. I always found like I could taste blood after I raced, it in, raced indoors because of the way it, it burnt my lungs to run in such a like sort of dry, uh, dry air inside. So You could taste blood. Ugh. Yeah, I, I wasn't actually like my lung, I, just the inflammation in my lungs from breathing that hard in the dry air. Wow. Yeah, would would I be able to taste that a little bit? Yeah, that's unpleasant, isn't it? Sorry, everyone. Sorry, well. Look, that look, took look, a turn. Yeah, I mean, we know what the social clip is. <laughs> <laughs> Andy tasting blood, yeah. And clip here. <laughs> so, yeah, um, do you want my... to, yeah, I would love yours, Sarah. Like, <laughs> hit, hit, me, hit, me with, hit me with your new story. Well, I've got another record, very, very different to yeah. the world of trap running. This is, sorry if I pronounce this wrong, Joasia or Joe, um, Zach Roweski. Wow, I mean, you've really done your research on this one. <laughs> yeah. Definitely, I'm that so was, sorry. That was incredible, So yeah. she is from Scotland. She lives in Australia and she has just broken the 48-hour world record oh, yes. for running. Absolutely incredible, mind-boggling. I don't know how anyone does this, but I thought this was even more topical for this episode because she broke it in a pair of Nike Alpha Fly super shoes. Mm. Can you imagine wearing... So the other thing about super shoes is that they're not always necessarily going to feel super comfortable for like a very long run yeah. so the first time i wore a pair i couldn't have really ever imagined wearing them for a full marathon or she's worn now. them for 48 hours and then. she's worn them for 48 hours and she's worn them for 411.458 kilometers or 255.668 miles i didn't How many do miles? the conversion so that's definitely right two 255.668 in 48 hours so 130 miles a day nearly that is yeah absolutely incredible so that's an average of 
uh, I can't do the math quickly enough. What did I say? Hundred. So like more more than five miles an hour for forty eight hours. Yeah, pretty. That was pretty full on. Incredible. So it was at the Taipei Ultra Marathon, um, and yeah, it just it boggles my brain that people can keep going because I think with really really long records it's yeah. when you keep breaking it down and go oh well, i could run five miles in an hour yeah. and then you go okay could you do that for yeah without yeah it's absolutely two days uh, <laughs> literally yeah, just two, just two, two days, days. Well, this come, we were having a conversation about this um before the podcast about the difference in mindset between arguably me and and the, these these people that are running these crazy like I feel like that that three thousand meters all out at your red line your absolute max for a finite amount of time which is a short amount of time say for me up to thirty minutes that's that's what I enjoy like testing my limits in that window of like I'm all out this is as fast as I can possibly go yeah but I don't think I have the mentality to grind it out for for, for forty eight hours this like, is what I love about running though is yeah. that like those are we've it's the same sport but it's just so so different yeah like we've highlighted two totally different people like the mindset of being able to run three thousand meters in seven minutes versus the mindset of being able to run 400 kilometers in 48 hours yeah incredible yeah i'd i'd like to know i'd like to get a little survey going on so uh get in touch with us on on social media or podcast at the running channel.com which type of runner are you are you aiming for a time uh do you have a goal in one of your races coming up and do you have any questions about how you might want to achieve that time uh, and, and conversely, are you someone who enjoys that kind of attritional internal battle with your own self-doubt to take on this? I'm going to finish. I'm gonna, no matter what, I'm going to I'm going to take on this incredible challenge over a certain distance where the, the goal is to get over that finish line. Mm. Interesting. Which one are you? you I I'm, don't know which one I am. I'm very definitely time focused. It's for now, Andy. Yes. Wait yeah. till we get you running a marathon. Well, running an ultra marathon it might not be that interesting but as a, a very quick anecdote i would run with a, a training partner of mine and if we did the same session but it was distance so running one kilometer efforts versus the same session where my coach would say we're running for three minutes and then we stop it, i could not he would absolutely destroy me when we were running for tar- for like three minutes so it's like you just run until three minutes is up but conversely i would find it much easier to do one kilometers where i know the finish line is in a specific place interesting um, well hey if that is a session that you're struggling with maybe that's the way to flip yeah, it on switch, its head switch it around don't do five by one k do five by whatever, whatever your time 1K it would normally basis. take you to yeah. do approximately five, yeah and, four, and just five, finish six minutes finish where you're finishing okay so if you're listening to the running channel podcast that was the news this week coming up we've got your questions so every week we go through your questions that you've emailed in and we actually read every one don't we we do. We have a lovely, lovely spreadsheet that is building week on week with all of your questions. So please do keep emailing them in. I love yeah. reading through all of them. And I think if one of the questions or requests was we could do an entire episode where we only answer the questions. Just questions. Because there's a lot to get yeah. through. Yeah. yeah. Top of this week was Scott. And Scott emailed in to say, I'd be interested to hear both of your thoughts on slow runs and just how often we should be doing them. Ooh. Andy? Well, funnily enough, we just did a video on this uh, on YouTube. Whereas about the secret to running faster is running slower. Um, and and the, the broad summary is here, it doesn't have to be exactly 80%, but Matt Fitzgerald is a guy who, a coach who came up with this 80-20 split where 80% of your running should be easier, slower runs and 20% is that high intensity interval running. Um, and that, you know, when I went back through my old training diaries, that that wasn't, I don't, I don't think myself and my coach would sit down and calculate those numbers, but that's what it ended up as. Mm. So it is, it's a really good rule of thumb that, you need to run slow enough, often enough to recover from the faster runs that you do. And the, the key here is variety and pace. Yeah, I think variety, that's definitely what I found to be the most useful thing within training. I actually, when we were out in Lanzarote, I filmed a video leading up to a Osaka Marathon. And I said that if I could go back and do this training block again, the one thing that I would change is making my easy runs way easier at the start of the training block so you mean actually listening to the advice that i give you all the time (laughs) yeah 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 yeah. well i think uh, so i was running them easy but i think it's very easy to go like oh okay my marathon pace is this yeah i'll just add 30 seconds whereas actually if i'd just taken my watch off and just gone out and run it would have been looked very different i very rarely looked at my pace on my easy runs because uh, you know i never i was lazy i never had a problem with running too fast on my easy runs but I, i tried to make a point in the video that we made about 
whilst these times might not be relatable to everybody, the range of times that I was running is the really important thing here. So, for example, my race pace was four minute miling. Uh, my flex. <laughs> that was <laughs> not meant to be a flex. But the, the, <laughs> then my threshold running was five minute miling, steady running six minute miling. And then my easy and recovery running was outside slower than seven minute miling. So I would start my easy runs uh, at eight minute miling and then just get a little bit quicker as I went through. But if you think about the difference there from four minute to eight minute miling, that's whereas a lot of people I speak to are like, well, my my pace is seven minute miling. And so I'll do my easy runs at seven minute 10 and I'll do my intervals at six minutes 50 per mile. And that's that's not enough range. I think you need to try and discover your faster paces and then also give yourself easy days where you just don't care and listen to your body. Also, if everyone in this moment in time agreed to actually do this, yeah. then we could get away from my newest favourite activity, which is dissecting what people mean in their Strava titles <laughs> or Instagram titles that, of their runs. That's a podcast episode on its own. So we would like the... Uh, For we example, should do that. Yeah. park run with Jenny. That means Jenny is slow. <laughs> <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah, so or, many people uh, or do, do you, that. Do you have, or having GPS issues, which means... Uh, yeah, yeah, do, yeah. I don't feel these uh, these statistics are reflective of my current level of fitness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Super <laughs> chatty, easy mileage. Yeah. I we, can run faster than this. We have to do an episode yeah. on this. Okay. It's so good. I saw someone do that on Instagram and it's Yes, it's we may have so stolen accurate. some of those, so yeah. apologies if you've yeah. stolen them. Uh, right. Uh, next question comes from Paul. Uh, Paul wrote and asked this. He says, for each of you, what is the running event or experience that you remember most fondly? Maybe an organized race, a personal first, or just a great experience with friends? I think it's a race that I did at university. So this is going way back before before professional stuff. Uh, the Varsity Match is one of the oldest uh, cross-country races in the world, which makes it one of the oldest running races in the world, probably. So it's Oxford versus Cambridge uh, on Wimbledon Common in London. It's been going for well over 100 years. And it's in the men's race, it's eight men from Cambridge versus eight men from Oxford University um, over about 12K of mud. You run through a river. It's like proper old school cross country. I did it one year where it was, you know, shin deep in water and another year where it was kind of bone dry. So, um, and, and I just, the thing I loved about that is, is running, I think I ended up in the wrong sport. I love being part of a team. And ultimately mm. uh, for 10 years as a professional, I was out there answerable only to myself and then, but I remember that those guys are still some of my closest friends. Um, it, it was this incredible experience. There's, there's a huge rivalry there as well. Um, so all of those things, it's it's uh, something I remember really fondly. And I, I was lucky enough to be the, the kind of university captain in my final year. And funnily enough, that's how I ended up meeting Andy. I ended up coaching me because I was trying to coach this entire university team, had no idea what I was doing. So I asked Andy to coach the team and I had to show up and do the training that he was setting. So then I got a little bit better yeah. and I asked him to coach me. So there you go. Andy, that's such a nice thing, actually. I don't often hear you speak so passionately and emotionally. Oh, yeah. I, I feel quite passionately about the uh, resurgence of the V-neck T-shirt, which, <laughs> which, you're, which you're bringing back today. <laughs> the V-neck is back, mate. Okay, Apparently, it's back. You heard it's it back. here first. According yeah. to Rick, the V-neck T-shirt is back. I got this from a top brand. <laughs> I'm sure you did. Okay, Sarah, let's hear your oh, running experience. The V-necks experience. are available. Um, my, it, it's so hard. I'm going to choose... I'm going to choose the first ultra marathon I ever did. Yeah. Um, because How many have you done in total, by the way? Two. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, and I didn't mean to diminish that, but it was, you sounded you like two. Oh. Two more than me. <laughs> 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 yeah, it was my second ever time running a, a marathon distance. Yeah. And then I did, I think it ended up being 54K. So another 12K on top of that. It was in Thailand. It was hard, but also not hard i remember yeah. we i filmed all of it and it was part of this incredible trip um because it was the first time first kind of proper time that the race was happening with an yeah. international um audience and international competitors as well and I, I was not competing i was there to finish get my lovely medal and leave and i remember i filmed it and we put together the video afterwards and yeah. you watched it and i i think i said like oh handy what do you think and you were like you're just a bit too happy. <laughs> well, you sent me the most incredible message after you'd finished. It was like kind of just this, this has been one of the greatest experiences of my life. And and also you're being modest because uh, I had reports back from the race that there were a lot of pros in your distance that you were doing 
who had like really lofty goals of how fast they were going to do it. And they were all like, I can't believe some, anyone could do this as their first ultra marathon. Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm glad also, they said that yeah. after. <laughs> well, because we yeah, all set it's... off, I think, because it wasn't like such a big established race. Everyone, the thing with ultras is that you never know what time you're going to run because it's all down to the elevation and this one had pretty hefty elevation so one person set off and i think she was aiming for like five to six hours so in my head i was like okay i'm definitely slower so probably like eight to nine ish yeah she finished in i think between eight and nine mm. and someone texted me that as i was running and i and i was like probably seven hours in at this point yeah. and i was like oh no <laughs> 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 I have not That's finished such, yet. such an understated reaction to the devastation of not realizing you're gonna finish in an hour <laughs> oh no Sarah but at least you were happy at the end of it it was it was it was like a yeah. beautiful I was out for 12 hours yeah. in Thailand by myself going yeah. through forest yeah. jungle everything it was just magical and there's a real sense of pride for me as well like uh, of experiencing it vicariously through the video that you put together but but hearing about it from you afterwards like rick was talking about me talking passionately about the thing i enjoyed like you can hear how excited you're about that so mm. there was there was a sense of pride in the kind of running channel family that you'd been able to do this incredible thing that you actually never thought that you'd probably ever get the chance to do no. or be able to yeah and it was also just so nice as well being around such incredible runners like the the running scene in thailand is insane like they are so cool yeah. yeah and even just to overtake one person on a hill i was quite proud of myself well, well, <laughs> and then amazing. they re-overtook me on the downhill but what, while we're having such a loving at yeah. the end of this episode which is quite unusual for the three of us yes. to be honest with you <laughs> um i've got to say that one of my favorite experiences actually oh, yeah, ever should, with running you, as well, uh, <laughs> you know what sometimes sometimes <laughs> i just wonder why i come to work <laughs> go uh, on rick what's no, your what's I, your favorite moment I've so I've a, two, a couple jump out. So obviously the first time around London in 2017 would be you know standout moment. But yeah. actually, probably one of my favourite ever moments of running was actually with you, Sarah, in Finsbury Park when I ran for the first time again after having an osteotomy, which is when they basically give you a new leg. Yeah. Uh, and me and you went for a one mile run in Finsbury Park in North London. 1K. Uh, 1K, yeah. sorry, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Don't let the truth get in the way of a good story, mate. Uh, <laughs> me and you went for uh, a marathon together. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right, so I'm going to jump in and just say that both of the moments you mentioned, the London Marathon and that, yeah. that moment with Sarah, were emotional for all of us involved. Like, I actually think you called me after the London Marathon in 2017 yeah, yeah. and were, like, pretty tearful about yeah, this yeah, thing was, that you yeah, just yeah, experienced. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah, I just think that's the magic of yeah. running. Actually, you're making me a bit emotional quite... No, there you oh. go. Yeah. Go well. on, Rick, cry. This one's going out on video. Did I cry <laughs> last time? No, I didn't. No, no, no. No. Yeah, almost, yeah. almost. No, but you yeah. know, it is. It is. It's, yeah. them, it's those moments, isn't it? That, that, that when they mean something. Yeah. So. I think and it, we're all nice being too well. nice to each other here. No, but what's nice stop. as well is all of those moments are uh, none of us won anything. None of us like smashed. No. I mean, no, none of us picked out stuff where it was like, yeah, I absolutely smashed my PB. Yeah. Look at the wholesomeness of running, bringing people together really and is. achieving oh. their go dreams and goals. Well, that's that was really lovely. Yeah. You know what I think would also be really lovely? If you're listening to this right now <laughs> yeah. and one has jumped to mind, email it into us, podcast yeah. at runningchannel.com. We would love to hear what is your one special running moment. Yeah, and don't forget to make sure you rate and subscribe to the Running Channel podcast. Follow us so that you get the latest episodes and leave us some lovely reviews if you like what you're listening to. You've been listening to the Running Channel podcast and we'll see you next week. And it will be days before I head off to Osaka Marathon. So stay tuned for that. Yeah, and wish her luck. Toodle pip. <laughs>